Welcome to the uh, final, final briefing of the academic year. Some of you may remember about a year ago, not quite, actually 11 months ago, you were sitting on the 15th floor of SEPA and we were telling you you were going to have a very different kind of experience here than other places you've been. Uh, I think you probably agree with me by now. Um, and I think also uh, we've learned a lot together uh, about how to do uh, sustainability problem solving. I mean, the culmination of this program is actually today. Uh, all the things that you learned in chemistry and ecology and sustainability management and economics and all the other courses that we uh, required you take in a specific order come to a point here as we try to help our clients actually solve sustainability problems. In one of the uh, videos we have of our alums, one of the alums talks about his job and he says, my job is like a series of workshop projects. I go from one to another to another. And I think that's really uh, how we built the workshop. We built this three semester experience around our experience as practitioners. And so what you've gone through, what you've done is very close to the kinds of things that you will do uh, when you leave. And so, you know, very often the clients uh, want you to do things you don't want to do. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough information. You don't have enough to really solve the problem. And so if you remember, I keep saying that what we do in our work is we make problems less bad. And that's really what these projects are about, making a series of problems less bad. And over time, those less bads add up to something that gets better and better. And so remember that you're part of a field where the environment today in this country is far cleaner than it was when EPA was created in 1970. And, it's, and it, the reason for that is the work that's very similar to the work that we're doing here today. So let's begin with our first project. Uh, so do I have my first briefer? Okay, let's, let's get started. Thank you, Professor. And welcome to the first of the final of the final briefings. Um, I'm happy to present to you today the work that we have been doing with the International Union for Conservation of Nature on their program about scaling up mountain ecosystem-based adaptation. This presentation is going to be in two parts. I'm going to start with explaining to you uh, who the IUCN is, what ecosystem-based adaptation is, and why it's, it's relevant in mountains. And after that, I'm going to go into more of our analyses, talk about the, the work that we have done and the recommendations that we've made for a handful of countries on how they can integrate ecosystem-based adaptation in their, in their strategies and plans. So the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, is the largest international environmental organization in the world, um, consisting of a lot of smaller organizations. So it actually has more than a thousand member organizations under it. They are, um, and in including in these organizations are nation states and government agencies, we should say. They're most famously known for producing the, uh, the Red List of Endangered Species that I'm sure many people in this room are aware of, but they really do work in many different uh, fields related to the environment, including climate change and climate change adaptation. And uh, an example of that would be this project on ecosystem-based adaptation specifically. The whole idea behind that is that societies, communities take advantage of the natural resilience of, of ecosystems to adapt to climate change. So one way to think about it is by looking at this diagram where you find ecosystem-based adaptation, or EBA as you call it if you say it every day for a semester, <laughs> um, at the nexus of conserving ecosystems, uh, adapting to climate change, and providing socioeconomic benefits for, um, for the communities involved. And this is highly relevant in, in mountain ecosystems, as well as in other systems. But in mountain ecosystems, at least for three reasons. The first is that uh, many of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world have very large mountain communities. So one example of that would be Nepal, as we see in the picture here. Nepal, um, as you probably all are aware, has a lot of mountains, and it's also one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to climate change. 
What you see in the picture is a landslide. Landslides on, on mountain sites are devastating to, to villages, to farms, to infrastructure, and to natural ecosystems. And they get more and more frequent as precipitation patterns change and as uh, glaciers melt faster. Another good reason for uh, focusing on mountain ecosystems is that mountains provide a lot of crucial ecosystem services for literally billions of people, whether they live on the mountains or, or not. Uh, such ecosystem services include uh, clean drinking water, agricultural land, forest products, eco um, renewable uh, power generation through hydropower, etc. And one good example of that would be uh, this uh, freshwater ecosystem in the Andes Mountains that provides drinking water for millions of people in South America. This one in particular is the Shingaza National Park in Colombia, which provides 80% of the drinking water for uh, the, the country's capital of 9 million people. So already there, millions of people depend on these ecosystems being in a healthy state. And then finally, uh, many mountain communities have large challenges with uh, socio-economic development. Uh, poverty rates tend to be high, in, at least in many of the countries that we've been working it in. Food security uh, is often low, and many of these communities also have significant challenges with uh, gender inequality. So one example of that would be uh, Mount Elegon, which is what you see on the picture here. Mount Elgon is a volcanic mountain on the border between Uganda and, and Kenya. And uh, Mount Elgon is home to around 130,000 people, of which the vast majority are subsistence farmers that rely on small-scale rain-fed farming. So they are very vulnerable to, uh, specifically to droughts. And each year, many villages on Mount Elgon are dependent on international food aid coming uh, and getting them through the drier months of the year. So the whole idea behind ecosystem-based adaptation is to recognize that these three challenges are connected and that they should be solved or made less bad in, uh, in an integrated and holistic manner. So that's why ecosystem-based adaptation tries to address climate change adaptation, ecosystem conservation, and socioeconomic development at the same time. The IUCN has worked on this for a while. Since 2011, they have been working on small-scale pilot projects in what they today call the flagship countries of Peru, Uganda, and Nepal. And today, they want to expand that program, both internally within each country and also expanding it geographically, uh, moving into Colombia, Kenya, and, and Bhutan. And um, that's one of the reasons why we help them because we uh, want to prepare them for this expansion. Specifically, what they asked us to do was to look at the major gaps and challenges there are to integrating ecosystem-based adaptation into national policy processes. This is an important question for them to get answers to as they try to scale up their program within each of the six countries that they work in. And so this is really the, the main question we've been dealing with over the past semester. One of the challenges for us was that, um, in, in even trying to answer this question, was that these six countries are really very, very different. So it would be tempting to just say the answer to the question in the former slide was, it depends. It really does depend, because yes, we're looking at mountains, but they are very, very different mountain ecosystems, and the communities living in these mountains are very, very different socially, economically, in terms of political systems, in terms of the threats that they face. So the first thing we did was to create a so-called situation analysis. We made a situation analysis for each of the six countries, um, which goes into the background and the, um, yeah, well, I guess the background information on the economic state of the country and the mountain communities, on the local and national governance, on the typical environmental threats that the communities face, and on the projected impacts of climate change. After that, we went into analyzing the policy that's already in place in each of these six countries. So we looked at international commitments, typically contributions to various UN conventions. We also looked at national and subnational policies on climate adaptation specifically, and also a few local projects already in place on trying to work on ecosystem-based adaptation. And then finally, based on these two, we made tailored recommendations for each of these six countries on how they could make changes to policy, how they could promote implementation of ecosystem-based adaptation, and also where further research was, uh, was needed. 
So these are really the three categories of recommendations we made. We, we did make a, co a couple of recommendations for each of the six countries, so it wouldn't be feasible to go over each of them here. But just to give you an idea of it, they really fall into one of three categories each. The first is the policy recommendation. This is the most abundant one we made. We, we made policy recommendations for each of the countries. And one, of, one example of that would be um, for Kenya. Kenya has a long-term development plan called Vision 2030. And our Kenya team analyzed this policy and found that, yes, it does, it does address climate change adaptation to some extent, but it does not really try to harness the benefits there are of thinking of climate change adaptation in an ecosystem-based manner. So their recommendation was that ecosystem-based adaptation should be explicitly incorporated in this, um, in this policy. And furthermore, they identified a policy window coming up because uh, the Kenyan government makes medium-term plans for this uh, policy, and the next medium-term plan is going to be uh, formulated within the next few years. In some countries, it was possible to go one step further. Uh, a good example of that would be Peru. Peru already has a lot of policy in place that address e uh, ecosystem-based adaptation. So here the question really was more, what can Peru do to, um, to promote the existing uh, policy and to make sure that what's in the policies is actually also happening on the ground? So one example here would be Peru's guidelines for public investments in ecosystem services. That's the strategy and a guideline that's already in place. And our recommendation is that the Ministry of Environment specifically should leverage this, uh, these guidelines more when the government is investing in, in public infrastructure projects to make sure that ecosystem-based uh, or ecosystem conservation is, is being taken into account during these large infrastructure projects. The final type of recommendation would be where we find that there is a lack of knowledge um, of the synergies between adaptation and ecosystem conservation. So a good example of that would be in Bhutan. Bhutan is covered by forest on something like 70% of the land. So forests are really abundant, and it seems obvious that forests could play a large role in adapting local communities to climate change, uh, for instance, by holding water or by preventing soil erosion. Um, but there is a lack of knowledge on exactly how to do this, how to manage forests in a way that also adapts the communities nearby to climate change. So our recommendation here is to, well, we call for more research on this and we uh, identify some of the partners that the Bhutan government could work with in order to make this happen. So in the end, the whole point of this was that we wanted to uh, give these recommendations and the analyses behind them to the IUCN so that they could use it in scaling up their program. So we went to Washington, D.C. two weeks ago and handed them these six beautiful situation analyses. Um, they should be out and you can get them at any uh, respectable newsstand uh, today. <laughs> And we also made six policy briefs, which are a more concise version, only focusing on the specific recommendations we made and written for policymakers um, in particular. So our hope is that uh, IUCN actually right now meeting in Peru with their global staff on the ecosystem-based adaptation project, that they will use our analyses and recommendations for scaling up this program, both internally in each of the flagship countries as well as in, um, in the expansion countries that they move into uh, over the next year. And with that, enjoy the rest of the briefings and thanks for your attention. Great presentation, Johan. Um, it breaks my heart that I know I'll never be able to vote for you for public office in America, but... Um, just move to Denmark. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I just wanted to like touch on, you talked a little bit about this Venn diagram, like the things that go into EBA, but like, what's like an example of like maybe a specific, more like operational, yeah. Um, Thanks for that recommendation question. Recommendation you made. Um, let me go back to it. Yeah, so it, it does look really fancy. It really doesn't have to be on the ground. Uh, one really simple example of it that we found from, so IUCN already made uh, pilot projects, excuse me, in the flagship countries. 
And uh, one of the purposes of that was to implement some concrete projects and look at whether they worked or not and whether they're feasible or not. So one example from Nepal would be that they improved livestock sheds for, uh, for small-scale farmers. And that actually uh, helped uh, reducing pressure on grasslands. It helped retain water, thus uh, preparing the communities for droughts. Uh, so that's the climate change uh, component, and it increased the livestock production and the income for the uh, for the farmers. So it's a simple example like that um, that that could be EBA. Many things really could be EBA. Um, it's just a, f a fancy way of saying think about ecosystem services as you adapt to climate change and make sure that socioeconomic benefits are provided. We have one more question here. Yep, in the back. That'll be our last one. Yep. Thanks, Johan. Uh, how did you guys approach stakeholder engagement in your implementation recommendations, particularly being so far away and maybe unfamiliar with the countries? That's a very, very good question and something I hoped I would have time to touch upon. Uh, we were very much aware of the limita limitation it is to be sitting in New York and talk about how these six different countries in the Global South should be implementing their policies. And that's one of the reasons why um, really the most abundant policy uh, recommendations we made uh, was the actual policy recommendation and not so much the implementation. The implementation um, recommendations were possible in the countries where first EBA was already, uh, or ISVN had already done a lot of work. But also, we did take advantage of uh, some local contacts that we had in each of these countries. IUCN set us up with their local contacts. So in, specifically for the implementation recommendations, we were in touch with the local content and we talked about, you know, where do you see the problems on the ground with implementing the, uh, the policies that are already in place. 